Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. I'm excited to talk about some current events that are going on in the city of Houston and excited about a newcomer to the show, uh, Professor Sandra Thompson. She's the alumni chair for the college, she's a college professor at the University of Houston and um, she chairs the alumni, uh, the alumni seat. I know I'm not saying that right, but she'll straighten that out when she talks to you. And then I have my a regular co-host, Mr. Danny Sneed. And we're going to talk tonight about the crime lab. The city of Houston crime lab has had an interesting history. And we want to talk about some of the current issues. We will also talk about mass incarceration. That is a real current and hot topic. And I also want to talk to you about a new book authored by Professor Thompson, Cops in Lab Coats. I think it's very interesting. Um, because she is on the board of the Houston Crime Lab. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Sandra Thompson. Sandra, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show tonight. Thank you, Vivian. So tell us about what you do at the University of Houston. Tell us about what, the, what a professor does. Okay, so I'm a criminal law professor at the University of Houston Law Center. And uh, you know, I teach my classes. Uh, I write articles. Sometimes I write books, and um, then I I try to keep very busy doing community different you know activities in the community as well. Uh, Sandra is a big community activist. In fact, I met her. We were both on Mayor Turner's criminal justice transition committee. So when the mayor wins. He gets people in the community to be on different transitional boards. Like he asked our committee to, he put us on the committee first, and then uh, it was about what, 10 of us, 15? About, about 15. About 15, 15 of us, and we looked at different areas of uh, policing. He had about six to eight committees, you know, like public safety, just all kind of all kind of community interests, and we gave him regulations. We studied current policies and gave him recommendations to make our current policies better. And we spent a lot of manpower on that, a lot of time. We've even written a fantastic body cam policy, and it's online. You can go to the City of Houston website and look for the mayor's transitional committees, and you'll see a list of us, and you'll see the Criminal Justice Committee and the report that we wrote and present it to the mayor. Derek Muhammad was also the co-chair with Sandra Thompson, and um, he did a great job of uh, doing our PowerPoint presentation to the mayor, and I think he appreciated it. But it's there for the city to look at and for you to review when you're talking to different city council members and with the mayor, and when we get the new police chief, because we would like some of these policies to be implemented. So, uh, Sandra, talk to us about what's going on currently and your position with the crime lab. Well, sure. So I serve as the vice chair of the board of directors, and most people are not familiar with the lab. They remember the HPD crime lab um, and all the scandals um, that occurred you know, from about 2002 to, you know, 2010, perhaps, we're still seeing a lot of issues. Um, but in um, 2014, officially, the HPD Crime Lab closed its doors and no longer exists. And a new entity was created, and it's called the Houston Forensic Science Center. Uh, and uh, I have been on the board of directors for, for some time now, si since, it, since the beginning. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. It's, it's 
one of the very few labs in the country that is independent of law enforcement. Um, and that was the vision, was that we would have a lab that put science first um, and uh, was independent of law enforcement. And this was actually a recommendation that initially came from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and that, you know, they're like the best group in the country as far as science. They have something like, you know, 500 uh, Nobel Prize winners oh, wow. that are a part of the Academy. Um, and they studied the forensic science situation, and this was one of their recommendations, that these labs should be removed from law enforcement. So let me tell you something that comes to mind, and Danny, I want you to think of some questions, too, about the crime lab off the top of your head. For me, I'd ask, so now, since 2014, so approximately two years, we've had the Houston Forensic Science Center. Now, it's still located at 1200 Travis, which is where um, HPD's headquarters is. And although that's a very tall building, most people would think, well, it's in the same place, it's the same it's the same entity. Tell, tell us how it differs. Yeah. So a lot of people think that, um, but, you know, it's just like any other downtown skyscraper that may have multiple different businesses in the same building. Um, the, the lab occupies several floors in that building, uh, and those are secure floors. Um, so, uh, you know, individuals like yourself or, or, or a police officer from HPD, they can't just walk in. They have to be admitted. They have to sign in. They have to have some reason um, to be in the lab because those are secure facilities. So they don't have the keys to these offices. And what is their makeup like? There was a time that prosecutors could hint, hint, wink, wink, and tell lab people to say certain things. Um, there was no real oversight or review, right? Um, or maybe it was too married, too law enforcement. Uh, tell me how that differs now. Yeah, well, you know, and this as is... As far as you know. This is uh, an issue that is still a problem around the country with police department crime labs. Um, and it, it just, it doesn't work that way in Houston anymore. Um, and, I, and, you know, and I'm not sure you know, that the district attorney's office, I yeah, certainly, yeah. certainly you're not trying to imply anything negative about that office. Um, and I know that they have a lot of ethical prosecutors, but, um, but our analysts are committed to the science. They're going to testify straight, straightforwardly, you know, and, um, if the science proves someone committed a crime, then it does. And if it doesn't, well, that's, that's how it goes. We want to know that too. Um, because, you know, that's how you can prevent a wrongful conviction. Absolutely. Do you know if a defense attorney such as myself, if I'm working on a case, can I submit things or ask for things to be tested, just like the prosecution? We, we're, we have moved in that direction. I know that we have done some defense, some work for the defense. That's part of the vision that we had for the lab. Um, was that it, it could be a, a place where local um, attorneys could have access to forensic work um, at a reasonable price. Okay. Because it concerns me because whenever me as a defense lawyer needs to look at evidence, we have to send it somewhere out of state, out of town. Yes. M uh, majority of our clients are indigent, and so the government still has to pay for it. And so it would be, it would be interesting if we could send things. And sometimes our clients will say, if you test this, you'll find it wasn't me when the prosecutors are not, in fact, even testing it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was just curious. Yeah, no, I mean, and, you know, the, a big goal for the lab from the very beginning was to be even-handed. Um, and so we have always considered our customer to be the criminal justice system as a whole. Okay. Um, and providing good service for both sides is really important. Um, to to the lab and so to that end um, you can now go to the website of the Harris of the uh, Houston Forensic Science Center and find all the standard operating procedures for different kinds of disciplines they're all online um, we're putting up corrective actions that are taken if there's an incident in the lab that's going to be addressed there'll be a corrective action that's going to be available online so we're doing a lot of these things. We're also moving towards um, comprehensive lab reports. This is another big area of concern with crime labs around the country. Tell me what country. that is. 
Well, you know, it's one thing if a defense lawyer gets um, a one-page sheet that says, you know, this is what we found, and that's all you know. Um, you know, you can't do a, you can't an effective. Test that. Right. Yeah, you can't test it. You you have no way of really judging what kind of job was done and, and the procedures that the were procedures followed. that were followed, yeah. etc. And so um, there's something called bench notes, which um, are the the more detailed notes that are taken of all the different kinds of testing that are done, um, what the results of the different tests were, etc. Uh, because it's like like with medicine, for example, if you go to the doctor, you say, I feel this. They say, well, let's run all these different tests mm -hmm. and see what we come up with. And so some of that happens as well. Um, for example, in drug chemistry, you might have to run multiple different tests to determine what a substance is. Um, and so we're, you know, we're now providing comprehensive um, lab reports. And we're working towards doing a all of this stuff um, electronically. Good. Uh, so you're saying you're working towards, in a drug case, for example, you would provide all of the various tests, you know, like we use this, 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 this test to yeah. come up with a substance. So that's thing. already being done to my, to, you know, I believe, I, uh, that's already being done in drug chemistry um, and in toxicology as well. Um, and, you know, our goal is to have all of the lab reports be um, available electronically so that, you know, you're a defense lawyer on a case, you know, you could log in and you could have access to your, to your evidence, um, you know, if, if, you, if we were doing some testing for you or what have you. Um, and we're, like I say, we already have the standard operating procedures online and everything else. So we're really trying to be um, kind of a full service operation. And it sounds like you're trying to do 21st century lab testing. Absolutely. Um, we've done a lot of upgrading of equipment and the like, um, and the people that have been hired, uh, we, you know, so many people have been hired who are new to the lab uh, with excellent credentials, um, as you should expect in sure. a scientific lab. You need people with graduate degrees in their respective fields. Um, so we now have, you know, lots of very talented people working in that lab. That we're lucky. Houston's lucky to have that. Danny, do you have any? Uh, let's introduce yourself tonight. And do you have any uh, questions or concerns about the Houston Forensic Science Center, formerly known as the HPD Crime Lab? Yeah, sure. As a returning citizen, formerly incarcerated, um, I'm pretty sure that it's been something uh, in my history that may or may not have put uh, something that I was involved in. Maybe it came to the your department. But I want to appreciate you speaking on this subject, uh, Ms. Thompson, uh, transparently and honestly. My concerns would be what happens when science reaches uh, a point to where it's a gray area where it's 50-50, well, where the science says, well, it, we could say yes or we could say no. Mm -hmm. How are the scientists involved in it at a personal level that they know that if we say yes, this will help heal some type of victim, family situation, highly publicized case. Mm -hmm. If we say yes, it can be challenged. If we say no, it may let this guy off. Right. No, I, I, I totally uh, appreciate that question. That's it. Um, but, but this is exactly what we're trying to address. So, and I'm not a scientist, but if, you know, if a test is inconclusive, then the right answer is it's inconclusive. Um, and I, again, I don't know what the standards are for that. Um, but I think we have emphasized, the board continually emphasizes um, to everyone at the lab that their job is to put the science first and not to overstate evidence, not to be to feel, you know, any kind of pressure to, to um, you know, reach a certain conclusion. And in fact, we have certain safeguards in place so that analysts can't feel that kind of pressure, right? We, they need to be disconnected from the pressures of, you know, we need evidence to convict this particular person. 
um, because that's very dangerous practice. And it's what's put a lot of people in prison, wrongfully convicted. It's usually with a scientific type of analysis that's freeing them. So putting the science first, I really like that. Um, I will be using that in court. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a time that when inconclusive tests came up on sexual assault cases, the prosecution still tried to slant something that said inconclusive. Mm -hmm. And we have to fight they would make it conclusive. They say, they keep asking these hypotheticals to the chemist or to the lab personnel mm -hmm. when it was under the HPD crime lab to where they'd almost be changing it and making a conclusion from something that in the lab they said was inconclusive. Right. So how do you fight that? And so they'll answer one side to get a conviction. And then when you ask the question, it's evasive, I don't know, you know, the yeah. science says this. And uh, it was not fair. I mean, I'm just telling you, it was a very unfair environment. I have not had one of those cases since in the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have some cases that are coming up that are set for trial, but they're not DNA related. Right. I have one cold case, but it did come under the old lab because it's been pending for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it had to be under the old lab. And that's one that we've sent, back, sent out to like uh, Archit Cellmark or Cellmark or Archit. I don't know. They, I think they combined. They used to be separate, and then they combined. Mm -hmm. uh, we've sent them out for retesting, and I think we're sending more things out for retesting. So um, that science thing, when it comes to trying to get to the truth, when you cross-examine someone, is very difficult because the chemists in the past have been very slippery. Mm -hmm. They won't just answer. It's inconclusive. Well, a lot of the people that you know you might have been dealing with no longer work there. I'm excited about the next time. Then I have some cases pending where it will come up because I, I want it to be scientific. Put the science first and the science said this and no way to sway them and we have to entertain 15 hypotheticals that are the same fact pattern as this tr case that we're on trial yeah. to where it sounds like it is conclusive and the jury is just listening to all these hypotheticals that don't really have anything to do with the case that's inconclusive. And one of the, you know, we have a lot of different safeguards. Another thing that we have is, um, we have testimony, uh, you know, uh, observers. So we have we have managers who go to court okay. and observe people wow. testify and make sure that they're testifying correctly. Um, and so we, you know, we have a we have probably, uh, you know, one of the best, if not the best, quality managers in the in the country. And um, the kind of quality work that this lab is doing has been recognized by the National Forensic Science Commission uh, because it's the only lab in the country that is doing it. The, there's one I am other super impressed. That's all I got to say. I am highlighting this. I will be using this in my next trial. I will be looking in the courtroom, looking to see who is the observer for this uh, crime yeah. lab person that's testifying, because that will keep people honest. I mean, that is, I have never heard of that safeguard. Yeah. I am, I want to commend y'all for that. I mean, that's a good one. Well, thank you. Yeah, they, they don't attend every single trial, right. but they do randomly audit, um, and they attend quite a few. And, and as a board member, we get reports every month about how many uh, trials were observed, how many people testified. Um, well, I can just tell you this. It, it would be good if they could attend all of the ones that where the science is a deciding factor. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times it is inconclusive. You know, so spot check those, but sometimes the science, because the science usually is inconclusive. Sometimes it isn't. It, you know, just depends. Yep. But because if it's conclusive, then you don't have that big of a problem, you know, but it's where it's inconclusive that we have. So that. I think the inconclusive maybe needs to be tested a lot too. I mean that needs to that needs to be because that's where the people get convicted because the jurors are thinking that they heard a conclusion that they didn't hear. Yeah, I see what you're because saying. Because the re report does not go back into evidence because it's basically hearsay. Well, Sometimes that, they do go back yeah. in, but usually they don't go back. It's just what's been testified to. That's a good point. And jurors don't take notes. Yeah, that's so, a good point, and I'll be sure to raise that um, with my colleagues on the board and, and with the quality manager as well. One of the, another question that I was thinking from the public perspective, you did point out that from 2000, to 2010 that there was apparent a lot of problems. How many persons that were involved in that, scientists and administrators, mm -hmm. that are still there today? 
Um, I can't really answer that question off the top of my head. We have about 200 and some employees at the lab, and I know that um, most of the managers are new, um, and many of the people who worked there, even in the past, were, were perfectly good at what they did. There were some bad apples, um, quite a few, but, um, but most of the bad apples are gone. And I'll tell you, the, the quality assurance stuff that we do, like I said, it's, it's unique. We're the only lab in the country that does it, and, and I'll describe it briefly. Sure. If you're a scientist in that lab, you now are on notice that about 15% of the work you're going to do is a test case. And you don't know which ones they are. I like that. Wow, I like that's that. Good I like that. Wow. I like that. It's huge. And this, that's huge. This is what was recognized by 15 the... 15% is a test case. Yeah. And this is what was... Um, recognized by the National oh. Forensic Science Commission because they were talking about it in Washington. They, and the question was, hey, do you think that we could do this in forensic science? Could we do blind verifications uh, for quality control? And the people in the room were saying, oh, it'd be really hard. I don't think we could do it. And then the people from Houston raised their hand and said, well, we do it. we're doing it. Wow. And so it came out in a report where they're you know, they are recommending this as one of the things in the future for forensic science, and they recognize that we are one of two labs in the world. We're the only lab in the wow. U.S. that does it. Wow, that's, that's huge. It is huge. It is. Uh, another question, um, I guess in the last 30 years, there's only four big things have came out to my mind. Um, um, the smartphone, uh, social media, along with smartphone, mm -hmm. reality TV, mm -hmm. Facebook. <laughs> and here lately, they did a series on the OJ trials. Yes. And that was my first time really engaging. Like I was like, it just happened. Where were you before? Not engaged. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? You know, I was you on vacation. You are, I was you on are, vacation. Are, at the expense of the state. I was waiting on OJ. <laughs> you were waiting. Okay. I was waiting on OJ. Okay. You were waiting on him to get there. Yeah. Right. And he missed you that time. Yeah. All right. But what came out of that that was huge was DNA testing. Yeah. And uh, people didn't realize that if you look at that, that was the birth of the first time that they actually the public could the see. world saw it the yeah. world saw it created it created uh court tv if you remember i don't know if you're old enough sandra to remember but oh, uh, yeah, yeah. the oj trial created I, court tv so there's a really funny story um yeah, re that relates to that uh there's a houston connection to the oj case so in the oj simpson case they there was dna work that was done by cellmark mm -hmm. and one the dream team one of the things they tried initially to do was to challenge the quality of the DNA evidence. Uh, but they were not Which side's DNA? To challenge the state's DNA? To, yeah. California's DNA? Yes. They, so they, they wanted to challenge the work done by Cellmark, but that didn't get them very far. Um, and so it's, did Cellmark do the initial testing? Yes. Okay. Yes, they did the testing. And... Um, Cellmark was headed up at that time by a person named Dr. Daniel Garner. Okay. He's now the CEO of the Houston Forensic Science Center. Wow, that is impressive. Yeah. So he's the one that's implementing all these wonderful procedures. Yes, in fact, um, he, he worked um, in the federal government in the forensic lab for, for many years and then um, moved into a position where he was... Um, designing and, and creating forensic labs around the world. Wow. On behalf of the United States government, he was there, you know, to assist them. And what's his name? Daniel Garner. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. So the second part of my question is, since DNA transformed, and it, it worked in two ways. It convicted people. Right. But it also exonerated a lot of people. Yes. So it's the first time something that was introduced that it helped, uh, you know, Wrongly Both convicted. Wrongly convicted people. So, uh, um, and also now in TDC, which was uh, when they made you submit DNA once you leave, and it's helped solve a lot of crimes. Yeah. So if you go and do something, they can always go back to that database. Um, but I want to ask you, what is out there now that even rivals DNA as far as collecting evidence at a crime scene? Ooh, uh, well, DNA is, is 
you know, has its issues, but generally speaking, it's considered the gold standard. I okay. mean, it's really very solid evidence. But any chemistry-based evidence is going to be very solid. Um, so to rival it in terms of its reliability, um, there's not a lot out there. Um, I mean, drug chemistry is very reliable, but, you know, that just tells you what the drug is. Um, but other, other areas like um, firearms, fingerprints, you know, they involve a lot of subjective analysis. Um, and so, frankly, the reliability of those, we don't exactly know. And this is one of the things around the country that scientists are working on, is to try to improve the quality of the, the sciences themselves. Right, because fingerprints got a real bad um, report back in London. Remember with the bombing with 9-11 and they came after that guy in Oregon, I think he was. And right. It was because they matched him um, over in Europe. They matched him and it wasn't him.